Thank you uh, very much for the wonderful two-day horizon uh, of both the strengths of democracy and, 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 and its limitations. And um, so I'll try and get the audience as, as, as quickly as possible. We'll just kick off with a couple of questions from here and then, then, then bring you all in, in the spirit of citizens' assemblies and uh, deliberative spaces. Um, so let me start off with one sort of question which um, I think underlies part of the argument you're making, but, but you didn't explicitly use the word in this presentation, although it's come up a lot in your other presentations, which is you have often argued that uh, in some senses the question of social justice is not just a question of entitlements and rights. In, in part, it should be seen also within the framework of a particular form of social solidarity, right? Do citizens identify with each other enough to care about social justice and inclusion? Um, and I think one of the challenges as we think about democracy is the relationship between competitive electoral democracy on the one hand and the production of the right kind of social solidarity to be able to produce the kinds of things that you are interested in justice, whether it's basic income or whatever it, our independent standard of justice might be. And even if you look at 19th century worries about democracy, uh, I mean, to put it a little bit reductively, there was one view that said like, that you needed extra political sources of social solidarity in order for citizens to care about each other, in order for a democracy to produce social justice. And there's another view that says, look, the process of participation in democracy itself can produce that kind of social, uh, solidarity. And one way in which I think this debate has, is running across all our liberal democracies, I guess, comes around the question of nationalism in some ways, which many think is a form of social solidarity that is a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for some kind of justice. So. Uh, what are your thoughts now, as it were, on the relationship between uh, what you see happening in democracies and their ability to produce this form of social solidarity that might be necessary, perhaps, for justice? Yeah. Well, uh, good, important question. Um, First, what is solidarity? For me, solidarity is not the same as justice, but uh, solidarity, both informal and institutionalized, are important uh, tools uh, or strategies uh, for making our societies more just. So solidarity is uh, something that has a feature in common with charity and a feature in common with insurance. It's um, like insurance, it's uh, helping other people, and so very simplified way, it's helping other people when they are in trouble. But um, it's different from insurance. Insurance can be purely self-interested. In solidarity, there is an altruistic dimension. There's an altruistic dimension also in charity. But there's something very different between solidarity and charity. Charity is a very, uh, assumes some sort of, uh, an equal relationship between the people, whereas in the case of solidarity, there is a sort of basic uh, equality, basic symmetry in the background. And so, how do we try to combine these two elements? Well, for me, it, uh, what the, the connection, and you uh, hinted at that, is a common identity. That is, in the case of solidarity, it's not that you are doing something for someone else as part of a contract that forced that person to help you, and huh? that's insurance. But you do something for someone else huh, on the assumption that this, is, this person is one of us and that person would have done it, although I may never be in that situation of trouble, I know it, I know I was not handicapped from birth, from, I know that person would do it. Um, and so I help that person out of solidarity because on the background of this common identity. And that's why there's a connection between solidarity and uh, national identity, uh, so that uh, uh, you, you can, uh, and, uh, for example, uh, uh, the transfers from uh, West Germans to East Germans after the reunification was of a much bigger size than any transfer, some of it 
purely potential transfers that were being uh, asked from the Germans in favor of the Greeks. But solidarity with people with whom we have a sufficiently strong common identity is much easier to trigger. And uh, that's for the sort of spontaneous uh, solidarity on the part of states, on the part of individuals. And of course, some of this solidarity is then institutionalized in the form of legal obligations within our welfare states um, uh, for solidarity between individuals or uh, in the form of various agreements, for example, between the, the member states of uh, the European Union. So that's what solidarity is. Now, what's the relationship between uh, solidarity and social justice? Can we bank on solidarity in order to achieve social justice? I think not. And, um, and I think and there is something uh, different than that entered uh, my story uh, implicitly earlier, linked to this civilizing force of hypocrisy, which is that when you are in a deliberative relationship with others, uh, so irrespective of whether you feel you have a, a feeling of common identity, but you have to take decisions together and you have to justify them to everyone, then uh, you are driven then to take decisions that can be accepted as fair by everyone present. It's not a question of uh, expressing and sort of implementing your feelings of solidarity towards these people because of a common identity, but it's simply because we have to take these decisions together and uh, these decisions must be justifiable as uh, being fair to everyone. And therefore, I think, and that's uh, very central in the European debate uh, today, and so and the, the, the creation of this strong, strong, much stronger demos that is really a, a realm of deliberation between people is what is the safest way of getting to institutions and policies that will be just. Because the risk with solidarity is always and that solidarity will be discriminatory. It will be solidarity with people who are regarded as sufficiently close to us. Now, we shouldn't neglect that source of uh, support for institutions like our welfare states that promote, uh, so the, the, that help to make our societies less unjust, but we shouldn't rely on it exclusively. The safest um, way of getting there is a properly working deliberative democracy. So let me just kind of push you on that a little bit more, and because um, it's one theme you have written about uh, very illuminatingly. Um, so one of the issues that is coming up in all our democracies, right, whether around issues of national identity or solidarity, is the issue of membership in the demos. Who gets to be a member of the demos? And many would argue that this is probably the single most electorally consequential issue in many democracies, whether it's around immigration. Whether um, and both liberal theory, conventional liberal theory, and democratic theory have, all, have always had this kind of apparatic relationship to the question of membership, which is, can a demos decide the terms of its own membership? Uh, um, or liberalism, uh, more generally, doesn't have a theory of membership. Um, how do you think the structures of democracy that you propose in some senses, um, can they help democracy navigate this apparatic relationship almost that democracy has had to the question of membership? Uh, and particularly given how salient that issue is in contemporary democracies. And many would argue that probably the single uh, most divisive issue that comes in the way of thinking about other forms of solidarity and social justice. Yeah. Well, um, of course, to answer that question, you must uh, uh, first um, ask yourself, well, at what level uh, should we think about social justice? Is social justice something that, um, I'm meaning distributive justice, uh, egalitarian distributive justice, something that only applies at the level of uh, a nation state? Or is, some, is it something that we must think about at the global level? And, uh, and among so-called liberal uh, thinkers, there is a deep uh, division on this issue. My own view is that there's no way in the 21st century in which we can think about social justice except at the global level. So I think, um, and so uh, I'm, I, uh, the 
content of uh, social justice, as I see it, is encapsulated in the formula real freedom for all, and I mean really all. And uh, that is uh, all uh, people, uh, all members of mankind, and of course across uh, generations. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't need uh, uh, borders, that we don't need uh, uh, nation states, uh, nation level uh, democracies, but it means that we must have this utopian ideal of a social justice worldwide. And that remote ideal, of course, must uh, guide us uh, in the mess of uh, the uh, policy decisions we need to take uh, now, including at uh, the level of uh, the construction of um, institutions. And so one of the reasons why I found the adventure of the European Union so important is that it's a massive experiment in trying to very laboriously, painfully, create socio-economic institutions at a level uh, that, that can help uh, the achievement of social justice and its stabilization at a level that's higher the level than the level of nation states, and at the same time a laborious attempt to create the political institutions that will make such socio-economic institutions uh, sustainable. And it, it's a very uh, hard job, and a job that must always then be constrained to some extent by uh, the idea that this is still relative to much of the rest of the world, the club of relative privilege, uh, relatively privileged uh, people. So that at the same time, we must think about not only uh, development policy, but also about uh, migration policy in a way that uh, combines the task of creating these institutions for further justice among Europeans, but combine it with the concern for greater justice at the world level. So maybe just one last question from here, then we'll, I'll, I'll open it up. Um, so, you know, in your talk, um, uh, you rightly emphasize both both in the sort of the, the virtues of democracy and the limitations, um, uh, uh, the question of sort of what kind of informational order does democracy create? And one of the virtues of electoral democracy is in some senses that it's the very process of seeking votes that uh, elicits a new kind of informational order. But when you talked about citizens' assemblies, um, I mean, in a way, it was a way of creating an informational order that does not rely on seeking votes. It's an informational order where the important site of the information is not the process leading up to the creation of the assembly, as it would be in elections, people seeking out votes, but it's the actual composition of the assembly itself, right? Mm. right? Um, and as you know, in democratic theory, there's, there's always this tension whether, whether the, 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 the important thing is actually the process leading up, whether that's, that's diverse or whether it's actually presence in the assembly itself. Um, and often these two conceptions of where that process of information order creating should happen are somewhat in tension with each other, right? I mean, in, in, in some reasons, one of the reasons why many democratic theorists have been skeptical of uh, assemblies that are organized around different identities and different interest just for that reason, that it's actually the process leading up that should give you that diversity, not necessarily just the composition itself. Um, so one, I just wanted to sort of perhaps invite you to reflect on where do you think that informational order is most importantly located? Is it important that it be in the assembly? And given how close you are in the citizens' assemblies to the fact that you might need a non-competitive uh, um, uh, 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 electoral mechanism to create that informational order. Uh, why not just go the full way and go for sortition or lottery as a form of actually creating diversity? I mean, that, you know, in fact, in Greek democracy, that was that was pretty much the practice. So, just just trying to provoke you, whether the logic of why you're invoking citizens' assemblies, randomly selected, would not also lead you down the direction of sortition as a form of selecting assemblies. Yes, but that's what I'm talking about. That is uh, uh, what I call the randomly selected assembly uh, is uh, an assembly that's uh, uh, composed as a result of sortition. 
Uh, but as we, there was an interesting experiment in Belgium called the G1000, which was a sort of bottom-up experiment, but made the, uh, one realize, in fact, how un statistically unrepresentative the people in that assembly are, uh, because you needed about 50,000 phone calls in order to get, in the end, uh, a bit less than 1,000 people in the room, and because there is a, a self and people who say, well, uh, it's too far, it's, uh, I don't have time, I'm not the right sort of person, etc., etc. And so even if you get the right proportions of men and women, the various ages, etc., there are uh, many unobservable variables that are really not randomly distributed in the group. But I, I, yeah, your question is interesting in, in making me realize that um, and there are good decisions for decisions to be efficient and fair you need to gather information from a sufficiently diverse set of sources. And so one uh, mechanism that helps realize that is vote fetching. And that is, you need to go around and go and talk to very, people very different from yourself. That's uh, also why uh, <laughs> the European, uh, so-called European deficit at European level is partly linked to the fact that the people who take decisions there don't have to go around and get votes because the process through which they get to where they are is uh, very indirect. So that um, is a weak mechanism in some uh, democracies, but it plays to some extent in, in, uh, in any electoral uh, democracy. But then the other way, the alternative way of trying to get a sufficiently diverse uh, set of uh, sources is by choosing people through sortition rather than uh, through election. And then you have them in the room, but of course you have only 100 people there where the, the electors is a far uh, larger and more diverse group. And then, of course, at the same time, these assemblies can, uh, can interview whoever, can get hearings with uh, uh, whoever they want to have, and that's a way of enriching uh, the, the information which is uh, uh, available uh, to them. And, but it's always, and so my general, as you will have, concluded even from uh, the way I presented things. So I, my evaluation of democracy is not at all process driven. And that is, or in terms of so-called uh, input legitimacy or so, the question is, what are the results that are productive and that, that, that come out of uh, uh, institutions that are structured uh, in, in one of the millions of ways in which our democracies could be organized? You know, this tension between a process and outcome, I think, and, 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 and you have been very candid in kind of, you know, presenting us with what exactly the choice is. But one of the arguments for worrying about process is not so much, uh, I mean, you know, you, you present it as a choice between is democracy as a kind of instrumental good leading up to some, some good outcome or is it an intrinsic good? One of the reasons people opt for democracy as a process, right, is, is, is this intermediate variable, which is, uh, it seems a reasonable way of coping with the fact that we disagree mm. over the substantive outcomes, right, in some sense, and, and particularly in uh, not just pluralistic societies, ethnically, but, but pluralistically otherwise, different conceptions of justice and so forth, right? And, uh, it wasn't clear to me, at least in the way you presented it, 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 it today, um, whether or not, um, or, or to what degree should we take the fact of disagreement seriously? Because if you take the fact of disagreement seriously, then the process or dimension of democracy actually does become more important. It's not merely instrumental, although it's not something we value for the outcome it produces, namely social justice. Well, of course, in, in what I presented, the closest, uh, and I get to that, and it, you could say, well, it's really very close, is uh, the first virtue, that is uh, the self, the, the disciplining force of uh, self-infliction. That is, of course, closely related to so-called uh, input legitimacy. And uh, it is the fact that there is this process that enables us to deal with our conflicts, our irreducible conflicts, in a peaceful way, uh, rather than uh, having to use violence or kill each other in order to try and impose our views. And we say, well, okay, we'll disagree, and then there are rules, and uh, now you won, maybe I hope next time I'll win. So it's present there, 
But again, the reason why I think it's good is not because I'm, there's something intrinsically good about this uh, in input legitimacy, but because it enables us to live in a peaceful way with each other, and that's a very good outcome that is itself part of what is needed for, for social justice to prevail. We'll uh, open it up to questions. I know there'll be a lot of questions. If you could be brief, uh, question, comment. Uh, yeah. That's uh, uh, basically uh, because our experience in India with the uh, uh, electoral space is a fundamental experience as to what do we refer to in our mind when we're referring to India. Uh, can we not, in, in uh, opposition to the idea of uh, a certain community, a certain language, a certain space in whatever uh, metaphorical terms we can say, can we not defend a certain set of values which may realize its potential in the future? which is basically to say that in democracy, we don't really care about where we are coming from, but where we are going towards the future. So for us, don't care about where you are coming from, meaning in, in terms of electoral space, what idea of this space I have in mind when I'm referring to in terms of uh, uh, creating a certain sense of identity. Now, can we not defend a set of potential outcomes in the future rather than something which is already existing like a community or a nationality or a or a, or a sense of solidarity with people I know? Is it not the something which is uh, essentially, which can be actualized in the future rather than something which exists today? You, you, you want democracy to be more oriented towards the future in some ways, I right? think that's the... Not uh, be bound by current horizons. Because that's a problem we fundamentally face in the Indian Union, more so ever one would... Uh, I think it's closer to your point about how do we create democratic structures that are more oriented towards the future and future generations than the present, uh, uh, as it were? Yes. The electoral space, and so it's really uh, the question of uh, um, who the candidates at elections, who do they have to talk to? And, um, and the argument is that it's very important that people who want to govern at a certain level, whether directly or through their parties, should address the whole of the population which they have the ambition uh, to uh, govern. And then if for various reasons, and uh, the parties are only present in some parts of that space, or, and then uh, there's something that will uh, uh, dysfunction, and we must try to avoid that. But in terms of uh, uh, the, then the, the future perspective, of course, the intrinsic limit is that however wide the, the electoral space is, it can, never exclude, uh, it can never include the people who are too young uh, to vote or the people who are not yet born. And, uh, and this it becomes increasingly important as a result of our technologies. Uh, I mean, it didn't matter very much in the 18th century when, uh, uh, when our technologies were uh, not as uh, destructive as, uh, as they are currently. And, but I'm not quite sure it gets to the core of you. Good evening, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my first question, I have two questions. First question being that with the recent, uh, we have observed in this era, the recent scams of Cambridge Analytica and, you know, the party spending. Don't, don't, don't speak 
too fast because, uh, oh, okay. uh, as I said before, the Indian way of speaking English is very beautiful, but I have some <laughs> difficulty in tuning in. My apologies, sir. <laughs> so uh, we have seen the advent of uh, a social media an era where the social media is supposed to influence our electoral choices. And we have seen the Cambridge Analytica scam and in the Indian elections, in the very recent Indian elections also, where the party spent a lot of funds on the social media campaigning. So what extent can we be sure that the electoral choices that the voters make are actually their own, uh, that the electoral choices are real? And uh, second question being that uh, you talked about solidarity being related with the national identity. And we have seen that in various parts of the world, this national identity has, is being increasingly transformed to, you know, a jingoistic identity, which is a more harder uh, form of national nationalism and national identity, which actually leads to a, uh, the dissidence of this concept being neglected. So how do we ensure that those who are dissenting do not actually gradually end up uh, being, their, their choices being, you know, they do not end up being neglecting neglecting the political space and how can we ensure equal political space for the dissidents as well okay can you uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so two questions. one is sort of um, the impact of social media and yeah. and the possibility that electoral choices are open to manipulation so yeah. the choices we see are not not actually the voters and the second is how do we prevent nationalism um, from becoming jingoistic uh, and the, the sense in which nationalism poses a threat to dissenting voices? Yeah. Well, two uh, difficult questions. I, I think the, the threat of, uh, uh, that comes from the role of social media is really very, very serious. And uh, that it's because I, also because increasingly the, the candidates and the parties become aware of the mechanism through which, uh, especially in the last period before uh, the actual elections, the way in which the votes can be uh, massively influenced. And um, so, uh, and, uh, as you know, there are various uh, attempts uh, that are being made probably in this country too to, um, to reduce the impact of so-called uh, fake news, but it's uh, very difficult because uh, you don't want uh, private uh, uh, firms to do this uh, policing, uh, you, but you don't want the state uh, to do this uh, policing uh, either. So I think uh, we are still at the beginning of um, trying to handle uh, this uh, fundamental difficulty that uh, in order to be a journalist today uh, you don't need any qualification because anyone who is on Twitter or on Facebook is some sort of journalist in the sense of uh, uh, creating information or propagating information and so you don't have either the legal means or the sort of uh, professional ethos uh, means in order to uh, discipline that. And so I, there are various, uh, also the level of the European Commission, they are trying to do things, uh, including with, uh, with journalists, but I find that a very difficult and, and very worrying um, problem. So it's, in a way, and so you, and it, it's a fundamental threat to the very idea of a, of a common demos, uh, because you, you, you get so bombarded by all this information which are on your own uh, feeds that you don't have access to the, the space that is common uh, uh, with uh, with other people, so that's um, on the on the first uh, difficult question, and uh, the the second question is uh, is not uh, easier. Uh, so um, and the way, I, and of course, the nationalism takes uh, quite different forms in in different countries. Um, so I, in Europe. I, Second World War was an incredible trauma, and uh, fortunately, we've uh, responded. Euro Europe has responded to this uh, this trauma in a way after the Second World War in a way very different from the way in which it reacted in after the First World War. First World War, it was essentially a matter of reparations and punishment and compensation and all that. After the Second World War, it was completely something completely different, and it was a very visionary and courageous uh, initiative that said, okay, uh, 
French and Germany are going to do something together, and starting with Thiel and Co. and things like that, and it seemed to be, I mean, so pedestrian and so, uh, that, but that uh, led, and so the, 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 in a way, the main public good that is created by the European Union uh, is the sort of self-taming of Germany. And, uh, and so therefore, there is a, a sort of, uh, through the absorption in this wider uh, group, including because the, the feeling of common identity is looser at that level, and so you can, uh, you can bank less or mobilize less this sort of uh, solidarity among the people who share the same national identity. I think that sort of uh, so transnational networks, transnational communication, uh, so openness to the outside world, uh, but uh, policy of integration of, uh, of of the immigrants uh, in, with the mutual benefit for the country of arrival and country of departure. This seems to me the way in which we need to handle it, but in a way that will differ greatly from one the country to another. But it's, it's a major problem. But for many of I mean, Europe, we have to struggle with the nationalism in Eastern Europe, uh, in various countries and, and so on. But at the same time, you must think about, yes, it's so different from what it should be, but it's also so much better one than what it would be in the absence of the institutions which we laboriously created and which we have to keep trying to improve. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, however disappointed you may be or you feel it hasn't reached its full potential, uh, when you look at Western Europe from the rest of the world, it's one, uh, one instance of where democracy has taken the population in some distance towards social justice. Yeah? Uh, and to us in India, it's a very important experiment because the gap between the promise of democracy and social justice in India compared to what it is in Europe is much, much wider, right? Uh, now, uh, to me, um, uh, it seems to me, I don't know the answer, but the architecture, what you refer to as institutional arrangements, etc., uh, uh, are certainly not sufficient in delivering social justice. Um, you can see that in India, where the institutional arrangements are not half as bad, really, for a poor country, you know, and these were put in place about 70 years ago, a fairly good constitution with fundamental rights, et cetera, et cetera, but the promise of democracy has certainly not been achieved as far as even the most basic capabilities of the vast majority of Indians. Now, so my question is, uh, when you look at Europe, uh, what do you think is that force uh, which enabled Europe or forced European democracy to address social justice and make a difference that the, uh, there is much greater equality in, in Europe. Poverty is almost uh, vanished uh, compared to other democracies such as, uh, such as the United States, etc. What is that force? And I just want to complete by, conclude by saying that you do refer to the demos, and I'd just like you to spend a minute in, in, in uh, explaining or elucidating a little more what you think is the role of the demos. Because there are political parties, or there's a state and there's a demos, but there's also the bureaucracy and the corporate sector, or economic interests, uh, which can, can keep a country from uh, moving towards greater egalitarianism and social justice. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, good question. Yes, I agree that uh, in a historical perspective or world perspective, if you look at uh, Western Europe, European Union, it's uh, sort of, uh, uh, in a way, um, uh, amazing uh, but fragile combination of uh, uh, peace and freedom and of uh, uh, prosperity and uh, relative level of uh, equality. So, uh, I can understand that uh, it can be look impressive from the outside, just as I'm a great admirer of uh, India, because I think that uh, the fact that India, compared to other countries that were in a similar 
economic situation uh, at the time of uh, Indian independence. I mean, the fact that something like democracy uh, managed to survive from uh, generation to generation in this country, despite uh, all the, the di internal diversity, uh, linguistic, ethnic, uh, case, the, the caste aspect, etc., and despite the, the level of, uh, of poverty, uh, uh, certainly initially, I mean, it's quite a remarkable achievement. And that is partly due to some of the genius that was incorporated in the political institutions of the country and by, uh, by their founders, including the former occupier of this, uh, of this building. So, uh, the, uh, but uh, you may say, well, yes, uh, and so why did Europe, in a way, do better? Obviously, the economic situation from the start, I mean, the level of development was different. But what played a role, of course, in many European countries is also the role of class struggle. <laughs> that is, uh, so uh, some people would say, well, uh, all this stuff about uh, democracy, the demos, etc., this is all very superficial because what really uh, uh, governs uh, the, the world and uh, governs our society is a class struggle, uh, so communist manifesto. and. Uh, and so, of course, there is, uh, in many countries, including mine, uh, in some countries more than in mine, like in Scandinavia, a very important structural role played by the trade union movement and then the political parties closely linked to uh, the trade union movements, driven then often by um, uh, an ethic of solidarity. It was less the demos, a sort of roles and conception of equity, than rather it was not and then very quickly it stopped being the, just a class struggle, but it was really solidarity among the working class, with the working class being the big majority in the country, with everyone needing to be uh, uh, as much as possible included in the working class. And then there was a struggle in order to improve the situation of the working class, sometimes also to the benefit of the, of the capitalists. And so that no doubt played a very important uh, role in uh, the situation of uh, Europe uh, today. Now, all the trade unions are um, in a difficult situation in Europe. In countries like Belgium, the rate of unionization is still extremely high, but in most countries, uh, it's uh, become very low. You have then the so-called uberization of the economy, and you have a number of uh, phenomena that weaken the, the trade unions, and that make one may make one worry about the stability of the current this current combination of prosperity and uh, and equality but and so therefore i think and that's related to the question about solidarity i, I think we need to keep um, using uh, the solidarity among workers as one of the ways in which greater social justice is achieved but of course trade unions, especially if they are very corporate trade unions, are also there to defend the privileges of a minority of the population. And so the, 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 the regulating uh, framework must still be the, the democratic framework of the common demos and of having then to have rules that can be justified as fair to everyone, not only the people who are privileged because they have capital or because they have good jobs. But it's certainly part, and one shouldn't ignore this dimension, in the setup that has made, that makes this combination of uh, uh, um, freedom and peace, uh, prosperity, and, and, and a certain degree of equality possible in some parts of the world. Thank you, uh, Philippe. That was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, my question, well, I want to raise a set of issues on your talking about citizens' um, assemblies and deliberative democracy as a sort of counterpoint, as some sort of solution in a sense. Um, and you didn't really talk about all the sorts of problems in how deliberative democracy might or might not function in the in the context where there's severe uh, levels of inequality. Um, and as you know, all the feminist philosophers have talked about it, Nancy Fraser and others have talked about it. 
And one of the points they make is, in fact, that unless you have, let's say, redistribution prior, you won't have adequate representation. Um, now, you might say, well, OK, we're going to randomly select our citizens' assemblies. But even if you randomly select them, um, one might say, well, women won't have a voice because of social norms. Um, Dalits may not have a voice because of some other similar reason. Um, so then what kind of answer? You know, we've had Gram Sabhas in India, and we know that um, they're very unequal. Lots of people don't have voices. So there, I think, uh, we might rethink the way you've talked about solidarity, because it's not just charity or insurance. Um, I mean, <clears throat> solidarity, obviously, your last comment, um, is a form of empowerment. Um, it becomes a way by which those who are disadvantaged then can find voice, even in citizens' assemblies. Could one not argue that? Um, and, and so um, you can have strategic solidarity, you can have empathetic solidarity, you can have solidarity of various kinds. There's a dark side of solidarity, the question of you know, nationalism and, and so on, jingoism. But there are other forms of solidarity, and all social movements um, have really, uh, movements that fight for social justice um, have use solidarity to, to positive effect. Um, so I, I just, I wanted you to comment on all of these uh, aspects, if you will. Well, I think I uh, fully agree with you. And so, um, first of all, I, I, I fully agree that uh, just having a, a random sample of the population, even uh, after uh, self-selection is being done, that the various categories that are represented in the room and that members of the various categories uh, will really be uh, as uh, uh, be able to use their voice and be heard and be listened to uh, as much as uh, as others. And so, all this uh, requires also on the part of not only the in the selection process, but in the way in which these assemblies are, are run, uh, a specific effort to empower the people who are uh, less. Uh, well equipped uh, initially when they participate in it. Um, but, uh, and so I, I don't think there is a, a quick fix, and nor do I think that uh, and these uh, 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 assemblies uh, constituted by sortition are uh, a magical tool that will get rid of, our, um, of the, the pathologies of, electoral, uh, of elected assemblies. And so I think we certainly and choosing uh, our leaders by sortition would be absurd. <laughs> we wouldn't even have the possibility to, which is one of the standard definitions of democracy, to kick the rascals out, uh, because uh, it's just sortition that will be decided who are the next in place. So sortition is, uh, and so these uh, assemblies are something that, if properly managed, and there are, I, I, I think these, the various experiments that are being done uh, currently are interesting, but we have to learn from them precisely in order to address better the difficulties which you uh, rightly uh, mentioned. And so, um, um, so that's sort of for that aspect of the question. And on the on, on the other part of the question, I also fully agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I have two and a half questions, short questions. One. How do you see the future of first past the post in UK and in India? How, how do you? First past the post system. Past the post system. Yeah. Yes. My second question is that, you know, we, in India we used to have a model that the corporates. The microphone a bit further from yeah. <laughs> the, there's, there's yeah. echo. Yeah. That the corporates were gifting money to all the parties and it did not matter who won and who lost because they knew whosoever won will toe the line. Now a model has changed that uh, there is a dominant political party which has realized that without contesting election you can form majorities. And uh, have you seen uh, such a model anywhere in the world? Without contesting election, you suddenly find you are in a majority in an assembly. Uh, uh, I think Mr. Mehta will whisper into your ear the import of the question. Uh, the, uh, my half question. Uh, about solidarity, have you ever seen 80% majority desperately seeking solidarity anywhere in the world? <laughs> so, I think, I think. So, so the three questions, the 
the, 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 the one question about this field of corporate money uh, uh, and, and elections. Uh, the half question is about what in India if I'm, uh, it is often referred to as the majority minority complex, where uh, uh, a significant majority, 80% uh, of the population, uh, finds ways of trying to enhance its level of intergroup solidarity, uh, often at the expense of minorities. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's the threat of literally a majority against a lot of solidarity, a form of solidarity that speaks to uh, majoritarianism uh, uh, in, you know, in, 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 in some ways. And um, yeah, I guess these two are. <laughs> In the connection with the first pass the post? No, these are, di these are different questions. And, and the first pass the post is an independent question whether what you see as the future of the first pass the post system yeah. as a mode of representation. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, corporate money in, uh, in the electoral process, well, uh, the importance of it, I mean, varies greatly from one country to another. Uh, as you know, in the United States, they are sort of stuck with it because of one interpretation by the Supreme Court of, uh, of uh, one amendment uh, uh, in the American Constitution. But uh, there are other countries where there are very strict limits uh, on uh, uh, how much can be spent by each candidate for each election. And also there is a significant public funding of uh, the political parties. Sometimes uh, my country, for example, there is a now a, a view that says well there is a bit of an overfunding of the political parties because the bigger ones really uh, can capitalize such a can save such a lot of money that that could in fact uh, live uh, keep living even if for quite a long time even without having anyone voting for them just because of the capital they accumulated through the public uh, funding of them uh, so uh, that means that i think it's a serious threat to a properly functioning democracy further amplified by all the possibilities that are given by the social media and the, and the sort of manipulation of the social media. And so I think uh, every effort must be made in every democracy to keep, uh, to impose very strong limits and controllable limits on uh, electoral uh, spending. And that is possible, that is in fact done in many uh, democracies in the world, certainly in, in Western Europe it is the case. And it has not always been the case. So there, there was at some point a decision to, to limit it significantly that worked and that proved sustainable. On um, uh, first past the post, yes. Um, so John Stuart Mill uh, already referred to in, uh, in uh, considerations on representative government says this is a ridiculous system where you give to people in every uh, uh, constituency just the choice, I think his expression was between two rotten apple and three rotten oranges, instead of giving them the choice in the whole country, and just, uh, uh, and because what needs to be represented in the parliament is ideas which you may, may be represented by or defended by anyone in the country, rather than the, the concrete and the stones of a particular uh, locality. Now, uh, I, of course, what uh, he pleaded then for some form of proportional representation. Uh, uh, Belgium was the first country to introduce this uh, proportional representation at the end of the 19th century, and that's a system that's now used by about 60% of democracies in, in the world. I think first past the post, in my view, has uh, many disadvantages, also shown again by the, by the British situation. Uh, the current British situation, also with the increased volatility of the electorate, also it makes uh, the, the stability of the jobs for the political personnel uh, far weaker than, uh, than than it used to be when you had more more or less uh, volatil volatility of the e electorate. Now, when you look at least proportional representation, there are also many varieties of them, and then some like uh, in Israel or in uh, Holland or Netherlands, you have uh, just one single constituency for the whole of the country, which means that there is a, a, a representation, a big fragmentation among the parties, but then the smaller the magnitude of the various constituency, uh, the more cohesive uh, uh, party system you have. And so all this needs to be weighed. Uh, and of course, the, 
difficulty of forming coalitions is one of the arguments commonly used for a majority, majority system, either first past the post or the French uh, uh, to, to round system. So my own feeling is that you really, I, even with reserve seats and all these things, uh, proportional representation um, has a number of uh, major advantages. In, 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 uh, I, I read, in fact, from Jensenius' in, in book that, in fact, the, the initial proposal coming from the Indian side was to have proportional representation. That's when the British in the 1930s then reacted by saying, no, this is too complicated. Uh, of course, the simple system is always the one one is used to using oneself. And so, therefore, uh, uh, India took uh, this other road. So, um, then finally, yes, uh, these uh, majorities versus uh, minorities and solidarity be between, yeah, I suppose that one, precisely one of the purposes of these reserved uh, seats uh, for um, and minorities that were minorities on average in the order of 18 or 20 percent was precisely a way of uh, protecting the minorities against this coalition uh, or the, the solidarity among among the majorities, and, uh, and uh, I repeat, I, I really think this is an extremely interesting and clever example of, in my view, as I see it, uh, of, and confirmed by this book I read, of uh, a sort of clever, clever compromise that was uh, better than both of the options between which it was uh, a compromise, and that helped not solve completely but sort of reduce the, the size of the sort of uh, problems you rightly emphasize. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, I know there are lots of questions. So what I'll do is uh, I picked up three people who would put their hands up first. If you could just ask one question each very briefly, we'll collect them and then give Philippe the last word. So you, sir, first. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be very slow so you can get in me. Uh, you, you ended your speech with, best democracy is dictatorship of the people. Sir, the people is a very vague term. Which people you are talking about? Are you talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat, or you're talking about the theocratic democracy, or you're talking of fascist democracy? Or which people you are talking about? This is a very vague term. Uh, next. Yes. Uh, one question, sir. We have a lot of people waiting. You have asked a very important question. Okay, sir. sir <laughs> the, the last, last, okay. last, okay. last. Okay. I, have, I have a long list, but I will yes. come to the end. Yes. Sir, for me, the, the, the true democracy is uh, the, 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 it's not the, 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 the justice and uh, the electoral democracy is the one which is proportionally representative. You have not said a word about that. If it is to be a democracy in our part of the world, with the 10% of the, 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 the votes poll, you can get elected to the parliament. That's the sort of democracy we are, we are having. It's not the European democracy. You have 15% vote, you go to the parliament. That's the sort of democracy we are having. What I mean to say is, what you have to say about the proportional democracy. You have not said a word about it. And that is the only true democracy if the people are represented proportionally, your point, nationwide. Your point Thank you. Taken. you, go? you you go? Yeah. Before my question, can you just summarize? Okay, so, so, so one was uh, proportional representation, which I think you just answered in response to the previous question. And the second was, again, a question you've discussed, which is, uh, if democracy is ruled by the people, the people is a vague term. Uh, the, the idea of the people, who constitutes the people is a vague term. Yeah. So, did you? Thank you so much. Actually, very much in the spirit of the previous question, I think the assembly has been trying to push in a particular direction, so I'll just ask the question as bluntly as possible. But the sickness that you have identified is indeed global. Let's say democracy is sick, it's ailing. The problem is that the cure possibly you're suggesting feels disheartening, dis dishearteningly out of date for the following reason that let's say the main, the contours of the sickness in India and many other parts of the world is the redistribution of sovereign violence, whether in the form of, say, lynch mobs or directly forms of repression. Uh, the second sort of critical ailing sickness is the breakdown of the contract of civility in some ways, that it was, it's preserved in moments of ritual or etiquette in the example you gave us of Obama and Trump, but what's 
strikingly different about Trump or democracy here is that the contract of civility has broken down. It is okay now to express hatred in public. It's a legitimate democratic tool for elections, etc. So in the redistribution of sovereign violence and the breakdown of civility, uh, it feels more like the problem is cancer and you're saying that, oh, I have a very good ancient medicine, here is aspirin. Uh, so that's, uh, I would say, some form of the dissatisfaction one might feel. Okay, that's a big, <laughs> two big questions. So uh, the other side of the question is that the, 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 um, uh, the disease that afflicts democracy at the moment is far more serious um, and has two components. One is what Brigo is calling the sovereign, sovereign redistribution of violence, which is uh, the ability of groups in civil society or vigilante groups to exercise violence towards others. And the second, relatedly, is in a sense the breakdown of the social contract, where even the norms of civility, you might say even organized, perhaps hypocritical civility, that characterize democracies have broken down and been replaced by norms where, as part of democratic mobilization, it is now legitimate to openly express hate, whether it's in the form of racism or uh, 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 religious prejudice or something like that. I hope I did do. Maybe you can take this. No, no, no. Since you have the mic. Oh. oh, the mic. Okay, why don't you go? Thank you, sir. So, my question is to both of you. This is in context of the changing democracies, which we are we are seeing because of intense migration. Yeah. So the question is in the context of migration and it's changing the way it is changing the demography of, um, let's say, the country or the states. So the question is in this context, how is it affecting uh, the electoral democracy that we're talking about? And it, mostly it's in the negative terms. So be it in the inter-country context or within intra-country context. How, how is migration changing the nature and character of democracy? We'll, be, we'll just have one last one. And we Well, so, so, so what the, the, the second question was really whether, you know, one of the virtues that you define um, attributed to democracy was that um, this, uh, the virtue of hypocrisy in some sense, the advantages, and whether we are seeing the erosion of that uh, uh, in, 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 you know, in our democracies. And the first question, if I had understood it correctly, was that uh, if you take something like the Puna Pact, uh, it's actually a prime example not of solidarity, but of advancing the cause of fraternity and democracy through conflict between groups rather than, as it were, through solidarity. So it's actually the fact of antagonism, perhaps along the lines you were suggesting around the trade union movement. It's the fact of antagonism producing democracy 
uh, uh, and possibly a new form of fraternity rather than solidarity. The last word. Yeah. Okay, but I'll go quickly. Yes. Um, yes, so when uh, I, I probably reply to most of the uh, first uh, intervention, uh, but um, and so the, uh, I use the, the term dictatorship also at uh, various points, but it's essentially to say that uh, a number of decisions are taken in our electoral uh, democracy that have an impact on other people than the people who have voting rights, and with respect to these people who will have to bear the consequences of uh, the decisions, whether they live outside of the territory or are too young, are not yet born, you can say that even the best democracy is a dictatorship. And because it only, and the people who can vote are only the people who live here and who live now. Huh? So that's where, why I use the, that term. Then, yes, uh, the various, uh, I mean, this, what you were depicting is rather, yeah, um, rather sort of, uh, 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 sort of a gloomy uh, as a trend, uh, if it is uh, confirmed. So I, the, I, um, so, the democracies to which, uh, with which I'm most familiar, <laughs> that is, uh, uh, in Europe, I mean, there are a number of uh, phenomena along those lines, um, but on the whole they are very limited. And because even when you look at the, 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 the sort of the gains made by far-right parties, uh, often on sort of anti-immigration platform. Once they get closer to power and they try to get to power, I'm the civilizing power, <laughs> the civilizing force of hypocrisy uh, becomes stronger. And so they have to polish their language. They have to keep saying, no, we are not racist. And they have to try to give proofs that they are not racist by then appointing to even to once they are in power to government positions, people uh, who are from uh, the, the minority. So there is uh, this sort of constant polishing, and uh, first of discourse, but to some extent also the deeds, which mean that the people have to speak publicly on behalf of these uh, parties in their speech, and they say things that are far more acceptable than what is being thought by uh, many of their supporters. And so. It's really, I, I, this is operating. But now there are, of course, uh, then cases where um, you can see the limits of this combination between uh, peace uh, as a precondition for uh, justice and, um, and, and freedom. In the case of, you may have heard about this uh, the trouble and continuing trouble in France, so called the uh, uh, yellow jackets or uh, the, the gilets jaunes, where this is a case where you had violent uh, opposition to um, to a government that also a government that's regarded uh, as unrepresentative of a large number of people. The current French government has an absolute majority in the national parliament, thanks to an electoral system that is a majority in system, with uh, thanks to 14 percent of the electorate and they have an absolute majority. And so a number of people, uh, especially uh, far from Paris, feel underrepresented uh, by uh, the, the, the assembly, and so they take to the streets, and sometimes in, in a violent way, and in a way that could be described as, um, as uh, not, uh, not, not very uh, civil. So, and the vigilante and so on is a phenomenon uh, which may be growing in importance in, uh, in this country, but uh, certainly not something that uh, seems to be a, a, a significant trend in, in uh, Europe. So, I mean, is this something structural that affects all democracies? Is it due to some contingent reasons in some parts of the world, in parts of Latin America, etc.? Migration, uh, quickly. Um, yes, so um, I think and so that, uh, I mean, I find that the question of migration in rich countries uh, is the most cruel dilemma for 
the left. Uh, that is, uh, there is a, a sort of big tension between being as uh, uh, generous as uh, you feel you have to be for the most vulnerable in your own population and being as hospitable as you feel you have to be towards the people who come from outside the rich countries and want to come and enjoy the same benefits as uh, the insiders and the left whether the social democratic left or the far left uh, in uh, Europe is really torn uh, in this dilemma. And the way forward, I think, is to control immigration, to have more legal immigration than uh, what we have now, and to have a policy of integration that really uses far more than we do now the diasporas. So the people who come from the various poorer countries who can, must be helped to integrate quickly by being obliged to learn the local language, etc., uh, being integrated in the place where they arrive, while keeping links and encouraging these links with the countries of origin and enabling them to go back and forth between them. And so that's a, a crucial element. And at the same time, with this increasingly diverse population, create a sort of fraternity without consanguin consanguinity, as it were, to say, well, it's possible to be a real patriot of the place where you've come to live, patriot at the level of your municipality, of your neighborhood, of your region, of, your, of the country that has uh, welcomed you, without being, uh, having the same origins. And so I'm being, having all sorts of symbols that can represent that and that are not linked with uh, a, common, uh, a common ancestry. So it's sort of inclusive citizenship combined with the good use of a uh, diaspora where there is a linguistic dimension which is of crucial importance, make these people well integrated thanks to a quick learning of the local language while retain, encouraging them to retain their, uh, langu the, the languages of their country of origin and retaining contacts with the people uh, in those things. But it is uh, and will remain, I will remain with, I mean, up to the end of this century and beyond, it will remain a crucial central question uh, in, uh, in Europe, in particular, a difficult question for, uh, for, for the left. It's, only, it's an easy question only for the neoliberal uh, people who say, well, the more open, the better, because uh, this provides more uh, cheap, energetic uh, uh, labor force for uh, the local capital. Then finally, yes, on the, yes, so um, just... Uh, Yes, you, I mean, no doubt you are far more competent than me to interpret what went on in the, the Puna Pact. And I can see, of course, there is a, a, a crucial conflictual uh, aspect, uh, in, uh, an antagonism. And, uh, but I, I, what, I, among the various ways in which this antagonism could have been managed, uh, so there's one which would have been then separate constituencies, uh, uh, separate electorates, and that would have led, in my view, to an explosive situation, just judging by a similar, quite different, but far milder situation in my own country, the way in which you would have then separate parties uh, in each of the two, you would have two, two, demo, two demos uh, next to each other, really, uh, with people competing with the highest on each side with the the, 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 trying to outbid each other in terms of uh, promises for their own group and to some extent at the expense of the other group on the basis of all sorts of prejudices and cliches about the other group. That I found that the way of managing this antagonist, which uh, is still there and cannot be denied, and uh, was, a, was a, a, a very clever way. That is, by creating, helping create a, de a, a common demos but the demos that's sensitive to the segmentation of that demos and therefore needs to have uh, reserved seats and make sure that there is an appropriate representation of the group that risks uh, otherwise being far more excluded than uh, the other parts of the population. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, uh, for coming out this evening, but uh, thank you very much for an extraordinarily wide-ranging discussion, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, this will just be the beginning of a conversation. 
and you will visit the two institutions that help with this, your trip together, the Trivedi Center, to which I'm particularly grateful, and Gilles in particular, uh, for making this trip possible, and the Center for Policy Research for joining hands with us for two days of really remarkable, uh, remarkable instruction. Thanks so much. Thank